Welcome back everyone. Uh, this is part one of a video that I shot way back in 2013. I alluded to this video uh, in the previous video which was an interview with Jason Hodges, Murray Hodges' son. This seminar I believe is as relevant today as it was back when we shot it because it's about safety. Now in this particular section, part one, we have an ex- uh, WorkSafe inspector and he is going to detail his experience and um, I'm show you the pitfalls of uh, uh, that is quite common within industry so please watch it and uh, I hope you get some something out of it thank you very much Firstly, I'd uh, like to thank everyone for attending today. We've obviously all got a very common interest. Um, we've had to swap our speakers around. Jim Kent was up first, but... Uh, Graeme Dent. Oh, sorry. Graeme Kent. Um, Graeme Dent. Um, he's got himself lost on the freeway. So uh, when he gets here, we don't know. So um, Jim will start off this morning. Um, Jim's an ex-WorkSafe inspector. Um, and now he works pretty much as a clean-up man uh, after accidents. <laughs> and... so I've never heard it called the clean-up man. Yeah, that yeah. sounds about right. All right, so um, now can we also have uh, mobile phones either off or on silent, please? All right, I'll hand over to Jim. Good day, thanks. Um, good morning. I'm feeling a little bit intimidated. There's people in this room, I'm thinking of this bloke in particular. When I worked at WorkCover, my claim to fame was that I was the youngest inspector they'd recruited in, uh, externally. That's in the days when it was a DLI. Now, that was 1977. I was there for the next 20 years, and like all of the inspectors, we learn off each other, and the more you see out in industry, the better inspector you become. But I remember Peter, his name came up often within WorkSafe because we were comparing notes just a bit early, I haven't seen you for how many years, when photoelectrics were the main thing, Irwin Sick being one of the main ones, I remember you coming in, I think even training the inspectors. So I've come here today with a presentation, I'm going to go through that presentation. I'm going to knock it up a few notches because this is not a room full of novice people who need to talk about the basics of machine guarding. You people are out there earning your living at it. Now, the main thing, I've got a few slides. I toyed with what we might call this. For me, design is essential. And that's so important because what I'm seeing, I was 20 years with WorkSafe. I left there, had uh, 12 months in Fiji. That was a good job for 12 months advising the government. Came home and then since then I'm working now as a consultant. A lot of the work that I get are accidents after the event. Um, disputes um, and even some work for WorkSafe as a subject matter expert on machine regarding. Uh, there's two things that I've assisted WorkSafe with, certainly the machine guarding bit, because the old DLI inspectors who had a solid grounding in um, machine guarding, they knew their stuff, that was their bread and butter. But that's not the case today, as you guys would well and truly know, because when you deal with WorkSafe today, it's a different organisation altogether. And dare I say, um, going to get even worse, I think, because just at the moment they're going through a restructure, and the word is that by the end of November, the few remaining older inspectors that are in there, I'm talking people with 15 plus years of experience, that they're probably going to take the voluntary departure packages, which means that the technical authority of the regulator in Victoria for mine will be a bit more diluted than what it is at the moment. And you've seen that happen over a period of time. So being here today, I want to talk about an actual case study uh, and related in terms of what we need to be doing and also probably give you a bit of a perspective of what WorkSafe need. Uh, the case study I'm going to use, I've taken out of that. That was a technical review under the circumstances of a serious injury to a Mr Sharma and it was at a factory out in Preston on the 2nd of May 2007. The poor man got his hand caught in a mincer. Now, whether it was a power press, whether it was a mincer, whether it was an injection moulding machine that wouldn't have mattered, the learnings that we get out of them are the same thing. And that is that when we build equipment, it's got to be built properly. What I see at the moment is that I think there's a lot of areas that have taken their eye off the ball. And that might be in part because the focus of the regulator isn't there the way it might have been once before. I think WorkSafe have a high 
focus today on work at height for good reason and manual handling also for good reason because of the costs, but probably less so in relation to machinery guarding. I've had personal experience where the inspectors come out and walk past unguarded power presses, and I mean unguarded power presses, I mean nothing, not just a guard that wasn't set up properly, I mean nothing, didn't recognise the trapping space, but walked over there to take issue with the manual handling problems that are further downstream. And that's part of the problem that we've got. The inspectors are trained a little bit differently these days and their priorities are considerably different to what it used to be. WorkSafe also, uh, they said this uh, probably about 18 months ago, two years ago, they were becoming concerned at the number of people that were having serious injuries around machinery, such things as power presses was the number one machine, guillotines and others. And what was concerning them was the number of amputations and serious injuries, but also the fact that generally speaking, it was a young worker, someone that might've been 16 to 18, 21, often inexperienced working on unguarded machinery. And WorkSafe announced the fact that they were gonna have a blitz. Now how effective that blitz is or was, I don't know. But what I do know is WorkSafe know it's a problem, but as yet they haven't done much towards upskilling their inspectors. As recently as uh, last Thursday, I went to a clearance sale for Landmark, uh, those rural agents, and there's a number to check out all of the machinery and put some information with the machinery to enable the machinery to be sold the following day, the Friday. And can I tell you, the, the fellow whose farm it was, an 85-year-old Bert, lovely old man, um, but some of the machinery he had wasn't that old, you could see it and uh, some of the standards absolutely substandard and that's new machinery out in the agricultural sector. So I guess what I'm trying to say, and I'm sorry if I'm a bit waffly with it, we've taken the eye off the ball, not necessarily people in this room, I'd be surprised if it's people in this room given your interest in being here today, but there are many places I go to where people tend to say I want to do it in isolation. I'm an expert on this, I'm not concerned with the full picture. The reality is you've got to be concerned with the full picture because if you're not, someone's probably going to get hurt, or whatever motivates you, someone's going to get into deep strife with WorkSafe. Um, let's leave it there. No, and the last point to make, I went to a, a factory. Be careful what I say, because I want to um, speak um, inappropriately to a client. And they had a, a large machine that made, as soon as I tell you the product, you're going to work it out, uh, made cardboard boxes, of all things and uh, went through and did the risk assessments of all of their machines. And then they said, oh, can you come back? This was a couple of months later to have a look. And as I walked through, it broke me heart. What was a brand new machine for making cardboard boxes, and it was over a considerable length of the, the production line, all these additional guards that had been put on as a result of what I'd written in the risk assessment and the report. And it looked awful, it really did. The machine itself was magnificent. I think the machine originated from Germany with some other things, parts of it from Italy and all integrated into one line. Then we had a conversation on site and I said, listen, why didn't you get this bloody stuff made right when you bought the machinery? You had your own engineers going overseas to source the equipment and to spell out exactly what you wanted. And these blokes are smart. They're qualified engineers, so they know as much about health and safety as I do. Why is it that you've got a machine that landed here and then retrospectively you've got to find the extra $100,000 or whatever it was to go along and retrospectively make it right? By the way, with WorkSafe sniffing around and you know keeping a close eye on what's going on. Anyhow, one of the fellows took me aside. He said, you want to be careful what you say when you're talking like that because the project team that sourced this machinery, because it came in under budget, they got to share the difference in the money. All right, now, have we got any psychics or clairvoyants in the room? No. You know exactly what's going on here. Apparently, when you go over there, you can buy a machine. You can have the Rolls Royce, which comes with everything, and you pay accordingly, and you don't have a further worry once you get it back to Australia. Or you can probably go for the Kingswood, which means that it'll be okay, depending on what jurisdiction you're in. Or you can even sneak in something a little bit less than that again. And that's what actually happened. So that company... They probably deserve it uh, because if they're not managing their, their funding the way that they should, not only do they pay for the machinery, they brought it with substandard safety, knowingly, 
and then retrospectively had to fix it, while the money that they had for the safeguarding went over here to the few that were in the know. Now, you know, that's just, I found that a real eye-opener to think, well, that's how a big company operates. They deserve whatever they get. But listen, having said that, uh, the more questions you got, the better. Design uh, is critical. Of course it is. Now, mincing machine. Why did I pick a mincing machine? Because it's topical. Um, there's not a um, few months go by that there isn't an incident involving a mincing machine. By way of introducing the mincing machine, can I tell you this? There was a company down at Colac, a young budding boy, young footballer, doing some work experience after school, cleaning the mincer. What happened? He got hurt, didn't he? He lost his hand. Front page of the Colac newspaper, the whole bit. WorkSafe prosecuted and they got fined under the Labor and Industry Act. Now, this is a few years ago now. I think it was about 300 bucks. 300 bucks. Maximum of $2,000 but they got 300 bucks, so that says something about the magistrate, I would think. And then what happened, probably only about four years later, I uh, was sent down to Geelong as the new supervisor, and I got a phone call, an ominous complaint, to tell me that this same company, I won't mention the name, um, that they're still not using guards on their machines. Can someone go and have a look at it? And at that time, the Portland smelter, remember it was on again, off again, over that period of months, so when it was on again, I used to drive down there every fortnight, spend three days and then come back. You've got to drive through Colac to get to Portland, obviously. So this morning I've dropped in there and I said, oh, fellas, I'm the DLI inspector. I'm here to do a routine inspection of your Mensa. And they all had a smirk on their face. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. They don't know me from a bar of soap. Maybe the DLI inspector before me was a shonk or did something. I don't know. So I went in, had a bit of a look, and obviously I'm there at the wrong time of the day. There's a big pot of mince, but the mincing machine is all clean. And then I said, where's the guard? And they said, oh, it's up here. And the guard was up on a shelf with all this other, you know, sundry items above it. Do you think they used the guard that morning? Wouldn't sound like it, does it? So that's all right. I said, oh, look, fellas, I said, we're having a bit of a blitz on mincers. I said, you'll be seeing a bit of me from time to time. Whatever you do, make sure you use the guard. That was a bit of a white lie. They're going to see me every time I drive through Colac. After about the third visit, I've called in there this morning and they said, oh, it's you again. We were thinking about getting you your own coffee cup. Right, well, I didn't drink coffee with them, but that was their way. They saw me as almost a de facto staff member. I said, oh, I see you've used the mincer this morning. I said, now, I just want to check something. So I reached around the back and put my hand on the electric motor. It was hot. And then I said, how did you mince that today? Thinking, well, they could have minced it at one of the other butcher's shops and then brought it to this particular premises. They said, oh, no, no, we made that here today. I said, right, now, where's the guard? Because I noticed the guard's not in position on the throat. And they said, oh, it's over here. So he picked it up, pulled it off the thing and held it up to me. And through the sunlight, I could see there were cobwebs through the opening, which is if it was in position, that's where you would feed the meat. Now, can you see that we're dealing with shonks? They learnt nothing after the kid four years earlier. Young child's lost the hand. Uh, they got prosecuted for this. I put him in. I uh, raised a breach report. We use whatever words we want, I put him in. Because I think these are the sorts of people that need to experience the full wrath of WorkSafe. They're not going to do it on their own. Motivate them. What do you reckon the fine was for the second offence four years later, after the first? And the magistrate must have surely known about the earlier event because it was so public at the time. Who wants to have a punt? I'll tell you, it was more than $300. Try 360. In other words, why do we bother, right? Now, over the years since then, that's why the fines have gone up to the order of magnitude where they are today. Uh, offences under Victoria's OH&S Act, as you guys would be well aware, under that piece of legislation, exposure for a body corporate of up to $960,000 per offence. When WorkSafe prosecute, if you have a look at their past prosecutions, they always start out with at least five charges. Now, why would they do that? We've all watched enough television. It's about presenting a very solid case so that there can be the last minute negotiations literally on the steps of the court. In other words, we got you for five, but if you plead to one or two, sorry to pick on you, by the way, not that I think you're a criminal or anything like that. Else does. <laughs> um, uh, answer to two charges. Now, I've got to tell you the exposure. 
I'm a company, one man band as I am, $960,000 exposure, even if the fine was a quarter of that, that's the end of me. So um, hear me today, what motivates me, and I'm sure motivates you, is we'll get it right. I've got to make a quid, don't get me wrong, but we've got to do it right, because if we don't do it right, we then run foul of all of this, and that's where it becomes a bit of Russian roulette. But more importantly, if we do our job right, we won't have what we'll see on the next slide. Now, can I just ask, and I'm sorry, I apologise too if I'm telling you how to suck eggs, because there's a lot of experience in this room. Simple hazard identification on a mincing machine, what are the things that we need to be concerned with, given there's probably people in the room that have never seen a mincer? What are they? This is the interactive bit, by the way. The tray up the top here where we pop the meat, and then there's a hole that goes right down, a chute or a tunnel, whatever you call it, down into here. So if I put my hand all the way down there, if I was able to put my hand all the way down there, I'd be in serious trouble, wouldn't I? And then we have a worm that's turning there, literally pushing the meat forward through that plate. And that plate has different size holes in it. I remember a butcher describing to me, if it's a small holes that you can't get your fingers in, well, that's not gonna present an issue. But if the holes are big enough to receive a finger, and it's not just big fat fingers like us, half of the men in the room here today, it's the young women, it's the kid on work experience, it's the females who have more delicate fingers and features than us. Um, he said, oh, when we put the steak and kidney plate on, I take it steak and kidney, you need bigger pieces of meat. So when we put the steak and kidney plate on there, where the openings are such, we might even have to guard that. I guess the other thing that we'd be concerned about too is that this is a food premises where this is going to be used. It's going to be cleaned several times a day, isn't it? Lots of water. It's a wet process. And also, at the end of the year, end of the day, because it's a food premises, there's going to be lots of water and detergent and God knows what else being thrown around the place. So regardless of what a mincer looks like, the basic things we're concerned about is accessing that worm and possibly getting caught on that plate. Now, with that in mind, I've got a case study. And I've refrained from putting too many in there. What do you reckon's going on there? This is the emergency department down at the Alfred Hospital. The man who's laying there, that's his hand disappearing into the opening of the tray off a mincer. And tragically, the man's hand has gone through the little, uh, shard, the little tunnel that's carried the meat down into this housing here, which is where the worm would operate. In other words, if I took that and turned it around into that configuration, you'd re it'll resemble what you saw in the slide a moment ago. So this poor man, I don't know how long he's had his hand in that situation, and uh, pain relief is a wonderful thing. I refrained last night, I put the photo in of his hand, and my son said, you can't do that, you'll get complaints. I said, well, this is a room of men from industry who know their shit, it's not a room full of apprentices who need a bit of fear of God. So I didn't put the photo in, only because my son said that. And it's not because you people need that motivation, but when you have a look and see, the permanent damage, the ball of meat, literally, is what it finishes up being, then you start to understand why in the Australian standard we have that system of categorisation that I think you taught me more about than I even got when I was in at WorkSafe. You know, the Cat 1, Cat 2, Cat 4 and all that? It's because if we're dealing with this sort of stuff, if the injury is going to be so horrific and so debilitating and so permanent, for all of the medical science, they can't do anything short of maybe an artificial limb later on, that's when we need to do the best safeguarding we can. And that's when we aim for something at the highest level. On the other hand, if it's a piece of machinery that the worst thing I might get is a bit of a friction burn, well, OK, we can get away with something a bit less sophisticated. So just keep that in mind. The categorisation system's important to us because this is happening far too often. Uh, what else to be said about the photo? These guys, they're the firemen. They've got to literally cut this poor man out of the machine before the doctors can go to work. And what the firemen are doing, you'll see one with a hacksaw in a minute, they're trying to work out how to cut it literally to free his hand. Because not only has he gone down the tunnel where the meat would normally go, his hand's come into the worm and is now an integral part of it. So the starting point is to get the tray off, and then once they've done that, then they can do something about releasing the actual hand.
I won't labour on any of these. And then we go to work with our hacksaw. Now, fellas, how long do you reckon it took all this to happen? It took a while, didn't it? We've all used a hacksaw before today. I tell you, the old firemen, they are a class of their own. They really are. But just think about the poor man who's laying on the table. I'm presuming still conscious. He's got some air on. But there are other photos where it was apparent that he was conscious. To what extent he was aware of what was going on, I don't know. Now, I guess the point I'd make here is, when we get it wrong, that's what happens. When we get it wrong, that's what happens. Now, WorkSafe, um, they would see stuff like this. I'd say something as horrific as that. Probably um, once a fortnight. Daily, there'd be amputations. A finger, part of a finger, couple of fingers. That's just normal. But when you get to this, where we've got a man losing a hand in a mincing machine, and by the way, here in Victoria, we've known how to guard a mincing machine since 1958. Today, as I'm going to say in a moment, there are a number of Australian standards that we can go to that give us the real advice that we need to do this right. But I tell you what, if we go back to the days of the Labor and Industry Act, now I am showing what a dinosaur I am, we've got to go back to 1958. There was a set of regulations made under the Labor and Industry Act that identified precisely what you had to do to make a mincing machine safe. Now, if we fast forward a few decades later on, we've still got this sort of stuff going on. So can you see there's a lot of work to be done? Now, WorkSafe need to be more diligent and even run programs from time to time. Go and go to a shopping centre and knock on the door of every butcher shop. That'd be a good job for an inspector, good use of their time. Uh, we should be doing things through the various, um, whether it's the employers or the union bodies, and we should be outreaching to the very people like you guys, because you're the ones that are making it happen on the ground, as well as the employer. Now, where do we go and get our information? Well, if you want to know a little bit about machine guarding on a mincer, there's a sheet from South Australia I got off the internet. It's all about two pages, and it's what the owner of the butcher shop probably would benefit from knowing. Then if we want to go to Victoria, well, we in Victoria, we do things with a bit more colour and a bit more gloss. I'm not sure that adds a whole lot more value because one of the things that's happening these days, there's the mincer. And we deal with a mincer in the space of what's between my fingers. I guess what I'm trying to suggest is we aren't keeping the awareness up. Now, in this room, you guys know a lot of this stuff, some of you more so than others, and certainly in some cases more than me. But the reality is we've got a disconnect between what's happening out there as against what should be happening. And that's why I chose the mincer. Okay. Um, the dangerous parts. Well, if ever you've looked down a mincer, that's the worm. That's where the plate is for expelling the meat through. So if my finger goes down, my hand goes down here, it has the effect of drawing me in. And once I'm caught, um, I can pull and push and do whatever I want. I've got Buckley's chance of getting out. And that's what happened to our man. Here's the tray. Now, there's an Australian standard 4024. It's a very thick standard. There it is there. And you blokes know that document back the front. You'd know it every bit as well as I do, I reckon. Because that's the Bible for machine regarding in Australia. The problem is... It's all principles. It tells you what the principles are. Then it relies on the reader, whether it's a designer, a manufacturer, a supplier, an importer, an installer, or even the end user. So when I talk about the person who needs to make the machinery safe, it's all of those people in the supply chain. They have to read this and understand it. Then they have to take that knowledge and apply it in relation to any individual application whether it's a power press, whether it's a guillotine, whether it's a compressor, or whether it's a mincing machine. And somewhere in that standard, well actually let me ask you guys, what do you think about the size of that opening? By the way, when the firemen have cut it, you can see the line runs right through. Yeah? Can you see also that there's no mounting points for that tray to sit onto the mincer? So that means that you can take it off and on whenever you want. It's not bolted, it's not interlocked, it's nothing. We'll get to what happened in a minute. Now, what do you think about the size of that opening? Too big, yeah. I reckon you could almost put a bloody foot down there, let alone the slender fingers and everything else. 
Uh, this man was of uh, Indian background, uh, probably lightly built. A big buff head like me would probably have trouble, the Anglo-Saxon arm and fingers. But just remember, it's not just um, the males, if you like. It's the females, it's the Asian men, it's uh, the kids after work experience, it's all of that. And that's in our standard. Uh, what else to say about that? They're making cheese. They weren't uh, mincing meat, they were mincing cheese. And when the cheese came out of the plate, they needed to stop the machine because they're making it in pieces about that long. Whereas in the butcher's shop, you just keep feeding the trim, the scraps off um, all of the meat in, and eventually you finish up with a big tub full of minced meat. This one was in a cheese factory that accounts for the, the white the markings that you see. Now, it's pretty basic stuff, as you all are aware. Now, there's the factory where it happened. And in fact, that piece that you see sitting up there and a little bit sticking out the front, that's the mincing machine. And I know what you're going to say is they're not too diligent on their exits either, are they? Right? We used to have a system in Victoria that every factory had to be registered with the regulator. And for your money, if you were lucky, you got a visit from a factory inspector at least annually. And that was someone come in, have a bit of a look, add some advice, kick a few bums if that was needed. We don't do that anymore. And I've got to tell you where I go, block fire escapes and things are commonplace, and that's sad. But if we come down and concentrate on that corner there, this is where the man was hurt. Um, well, let's have a close-up, a bit better, rather than me try and talk to it. Now, first of all, it's a food premises, and we've got some clothing thrown there, whether that's after the uh, rescue, probably not, by the way, because you'd hardly get a jumper off with your hand jammed in the paraphernalia that you've seen. So straight away, you'd say, what's going on? That's the finished product there, and if you have a look, they look to be pieces of cheese about this long. And it seems that when the tray was in position, sitting on that mincer, you might notice an electrical cable comes down to that switch there. That switch is of a sort, an emergency stop. Not the mushroom-headed sort that we like. Mushroom-headed because it's bright, it's visual, it's in your face, and when you lash out, even if you're in bloody pain or distracted, chances are you'll hit it and arrest the movement of the machine. But in a moment you'll see what they've done to protect the switch, they've put a plastic bag over it with a couple of um, rubber bands around it. And the work practice at the time was, to make this machine run, they don't want it running all of the time. They just want to ex um, extrude 12 inches of cheese and then pack it. So while the bloke's working the mincer, he's using his knee to push onto that switch to tell the machine to run. Then when he's got his 12 inches, take the knee off the button. Now how would you like to do that for eight hours? Forget about ma machine guarding for the minute. Think about the manual handling. WorkSafe will tell us that's where a lot of the money's going because workers are being asked to do silly things like this. Okay, what's the next one? That's just a bit of a close-up again, showing you a bit more about the switch. I don't think for one moment that this is how it might have left the factory, right? So when we talk in a moment about the designer's responsibilities and the supplier, that supply chain we talked about, I don't think I'd be blaming them for that. I think more than likely that's a little um, improvisation that's been made at the factory. I just, um, in all the years, I've seen a bit. I've got to tell you, I've never seen people, professional people, people of your calibre that would do anything like that. It's just not on. It doesn't even bear thinking. But we've seen stuff like this in the factories because they're experts at making cheese. They're not experts at machinery guarding or um, wiring rules or whatever else it might be. And there's a close-up of the actual control. Now, the frightening thing was, if we look elsewhere in the same workplace, guess what? They've got a bigger machine that's set up exactly in the same way. And because it's much bigger in size, I can only guess it's probably got a bigger motor under there too, which means if we're going to get trapped up, we're going to have real problems. Same configuration. And look at the diameter of that. And you can see how thick the tray is. Not hard. What would that be, fellas? What do you reckon? 251. Yeah. Yeah. You know why women are bad drivers? Because all their life they've been taught that that is six inches. Is that right? No, probably not. Sorry, bro. Listen, it's the same thing. Regardless of what configuration it may be, 
Now, that looks to be a bolt of some sort. Looks like that tray might be bolted into position, but I'm only guessing. These were the photos taken by the police, not even work cover. The police went out, took all the photos at random, and then after, they realised how bad the man's injuries were, then they passed it over to WorkSafe. And this matter was prosecuted, um, I think, about 18 months ago now. How about the notion of even leaving the wheels on it and sitting it on a pallet? Can you see this thing wandering around? Like, I know it's um, poor form to be looking at something like this and, and nitpicking. I don't mean to do that, but it points to an organisation that needs to get some help. And had they had that help from people like you, from consultants like me, they might have stood a better chance of making sure they were set up properly. But I've got to say, even to look on this alone, I just think that's absolute madness. Would you not agree? Yeah, crazy stuff. Okay, now, how do we fix all this? And here's where I tell you how to suck eggs. You've got to apply a risk management process, not just because Jim Kent said today it's a good idea, but because that's what's required, not only by the um, OHS Act and the thicker regulations, and there's where we find everything to do with plant, but also until WorkSafe come out with a compliance code for plant, we're still using this. And in there it talks about an obligation on the designer, the manufacturer, the uh, supplier, the importer, the installer, and then the end user to make sure that they apply a risk assessment process to any plant before it's put into service. It's as simple as that. And it's not just about the piece of plant, it's about the environment where it's going to operate. If someone builds a piece of plant that's got a set of operating controls that requires me as the operator, this is where I have to be because this is where the levers and the buttons and things are, we better make sure that there's not a forklift runway behind me where if I step backwards I'll probably die being struck by a forklift. So it's not just about the piece of machinery, of course it's about the piece of machinery, piece of plant, let's say, but it's about the environment where it's operating. And what it calls for is a holistic approach. The days of the pneumatic sky or the hydraulic sky saying, ah, oh, no, I'm just going to put the hydraulics in, I'm not concerned with that other stuff. Mate, you are because you're part of it, right? Now, uh, designer, think about the supply chain. I've done a fair bit of work for a large company that makes cardboard boxes, and there are circumstances where they often get to wear the five hats. They'll have something designed to their requirement. They'll source it from overseas with some modifications. They'll import it themselves. They'll have their own main fitters bolting it down and then commissioning it. So it's possible that in that supply chain that you can wear five hats at once. Now to talk about this, this process I'm sure that you're familiar with, but I'd like to just uh, take a moment to explain something. And if I'm telling you how to suck eggs, I apologise in advance. This has always been, when we talk about the principles of risk management, this has always been the approach. And you know what? For those of us that haven't done much in the way of risk management, you already know what it is because of what you did this morning when you drove your car. If you saw a problem, you did, oh shit, that might be serious. I better slow down or I better take a bypass, whatever. Risk assessment, risk management is something that's intuitive. Now, we've spent about 30 years to date educating everyone in Victoria that this is how the system is. Can I just mention something else? What's a safe work method statement? It's a piece of paper. A piece of paper never did anything. But if the blokes can read the piece of paper and understand it, then the piece of paper is going to add some value. Today we call it the safe work method statement. We used to call it a JSA, didn't we? Job Safety Analysis. So for 30 years, we've no sooner educated everyone. When you say JSA, it's part of the vernacular. You know exactly what I'm talking about. For reasons best known to work safe, and it was political, if you're interested, I'll talk to you over a tea at the break, they changed it to a safe work method statement just to align our terminology in Victoria with what they were using at that point federally. Same thing here. Can I tell you this, in 2007, when these regulations were made, prior to 2007, my son, uh, Josh, is a plumber, and if he was going to set up his own little business, I hope he'll do one day, he could go into the government bookshop, 
and say to the librarian, listen, I'm going to set up a business in 12 months. Can you give me whatever legislation you reckon I need? And I'll start reading up and understanding it. Because that's what you'd do, setting up a business, wouldn't you? Then you go to the tax office and all the other places as well. And the librarian would say, oh, well, Josh, you need a copy of this OHS Act. That's about 15 bucks. And uh, you need the one on asbestos, because you plumbers are doing a bit of asbestos. You need the confined spaces. And while we're at it, you need a bit on plant. And working at height, that's the big one for you blokes, right? So for change out of 30 bucks, you'd come away with the little legislative package that you needed. For reasons best known to WorkSafe, in 2007, they took all of the regulations and put them into one document. And that's what you're looking at there. Now, it's overwhelming, the size of it. But again, my son buys one of these for about 120 bucks, Graham. Not lost track, 120 I think. And again, you only need to be concerned with the sections that are in there. So they're the regulations and they spell out what we have to do. What they also did in 2007 was something that I think was quite unforgivable. It was nonsense. Um, uh, an employer organisation, I will be factual, I don't want this to, to distort what I'm telling you. I have strong views about it, obviously. And I'm not political in this sense, but what happened? One of the employer organisations went to WorkSafe and said, we think this risk assessment process is a bit of a nonsense. If the employers identified a problem, why should they waste valuable time and resources doing a risk assessment when they should be able to go, here's the problem, let's go straight to the control. And instead of WorkSafe saying, on your bike, don't waste our time, they didn't do that. And trades all sat on their hands too, by the way. That's why it eventually became law. The example that they gave was this one. They said, WorkSafe said, can you give us an example? And the person who was advocating removing risk assessment from the whole equation said, well, if an employer recognises there's a danger of a forklift tipping over, clearly why fiddle around with risk assessment when all you've got to do is put a seatbelt on the forklift? And that was the example that was quoted and documented and talked about. Now, me mate is just shaking his head. Few of you are. What's the problem with that, by the way? What's the problem? Here's the problem. Let's jump straight into the fix. Why is the forklift tipping over? Putting a seatbelt on. That's only fitting a seatbelt is only as good as the operator wearing it every time. And I'm not sure what the discipline is in that workplace. It could be that the forklift we're using is one of those um, smaller ones that has no suspension that's used in warehouses because it's got no suspension, it's running on a concrete floor. And because there's no suspension, well, we have a little bit of support for the operator built into the seat. But as soon as we take that forklift out onto a gravel out there where there's a few potholes and try to load a truck with an inappropriate forklift, is that the reason why the thing's tipping over? Because if that's the case, we could either get another forklift called an all-terrain forklift, which is designed to work over uneven ground, or better still, let's get the concreters in and concrete the area, and we can still use the same plant. Now, there's a bit of a logic about that, isn't there? When it was said, and the example of the forklift was the one that was articulated and explained and driven everywhere, WorkSafe should have said, listen, what you're talking is nonsense. You have to go through an assessment process because only by going through the assessment process will you be clear in your mind as to what is the most appropriate risk control. And you people know about a thing called the hierarchy of control where we say the best thing you can do is eliminate the problem altogether. If you can't do that, you can substitute the risk with something of a lower risk. If you can't do that, then you can use engineering principles. And if you can't do that, then you can use administrative risk controls, training procedures. And if you can't do that, then you can use personal protective equipment. Now, can I tell you, for 30 years, me, Graham, Murray, everyone that's got a, a real interest in this health and safety, we've been telling everyone about the hierarchy of control. Because you just can't jump into PPE. Whether it's a seatbelt or whether it's a respirator, uh, or whether it's where you hear hearing protection beyond this line, it doesn't work. Why would you reckon that's the case? Can I embarrass all of us? Put your hand up if you've never had a speeding ticket. You've never had one. Well done. I'm envious. You drive? No. Yeah. 
<laughs> Not since 0.05, isn't it? <laughs> Listen, it's, uh, it's human nature, right? Um, and I've had more than my share of tickets. And I delude myself by saying, yeah, yeah, but you're doing so many kilometres. The truth of the matter is when I've been caught, it's been for silliness on my part. And that's true of all of us. Now, um, that's the problem with PPE. So if we come back to this, if we're just going to say whack in a seatbelt and that's the end of the equation, chances are we're still going to be back in a month's time when the forklift still tipped over and this time the fellow didn't have his seatbelt on and as it tipped over he got ejected and the overhead roof of the uh, forklift come over and decapitated him. That's happened many, many times in Victoria. So can you see how stupid this whole conversation was back in 2007? The sad thing is... It prevailed. <laughs> this, this conversation, this position prevailed. So when you read the regulations, it talks about you've got to identify the hazard, then you've got to go straight to risk control. In other words, that's removed. Unless you're looking up the regulations to do with the construction industry or the hazardous facilities, hazardous you know, paint factories, refineries there's still a legal obligation to carry out risk assessment in those two industries. And because those two industries are high risk, based on the number of people that are being hurt in the construction industry, actually being hurt, or the refineries and that because of the potential, because when we have a Longford, often it's multiple people, as we all know from experience, we still recognise the need for risk assessment in relation to those two industries, but we don't require it or mandate it in relation to plant. Now, I just think that's stupid, truly. Now, can I tell you, we go to a meeting, WorkSafe had a conference, and I uh, went with a mate of ours, uh, Heather Baker Goldsmith, one of the, also ex-WorkSafe inspector. And it was quite funny, because um, we were walking in, and she said, now, you sit on your hands, because I can't help myself. You're in a public forum, you're being told stupidity. You tend to want to ask, you know? And uh, she said, you leave it to me. So I was on my best behaviour. When we got to this, it was the Mulgrave Country Club. And WorkSafe was there to talk about the new regulations, these very things here. And the guy out the front, who's one of the directors, a very senior man, he stood up and said, oh, and we've listened to what you've said. You don't have to do risk assessment anymore. All you have to do is identify and then go to control. In other words, he's parroting. Someone's written a script for him. And then Heather stood up and said, but Mr. Winholtz, Eric Winholtz was the man, no longer there. Mr. Winholtz, if you don't go through a risk assessment process, how will you truly understand what's the potential of that hazard? Will it kill or will it give you a friction burn? As I've already said in relation to the categorisation. And he said, oh, um, you know, we just want to identify. We want to get on with it. We want to fix these things. We want to get on the front foot. He didn't answer the question. So then she said, Mr. Winholtz, if your inspectors come out after a hazard's been identified and if the employer has done something that is not as a substandard, let's say they did it to save money, something easy, let's slip down to Bunnings and buy a quick bit of something, you know, a bit of PPE, be careful, or that sort of nonsense. What will your inspector do? He said, oh, well, the inspectors will satisfy themselves that there's a correct fit between the hazard and the risk control that you've put in place. She said, well, what would you call that process? Now hold there, what, what's that process by the way? It's risk assessment, isn't it? Of course it is. What I'm trying to say is without being unkind to Mr. Winholtz, he's moved on and gone somewhere else. We've got this circular thing that goes on. Can I tell you what I tell my clients? You need to understand what the law is, but you need to know, don't get yourself into trouble. There is still a requirement to carry out risk assessment because even though it's not mandated in the legislation, unless other ex there are places where it is, by the way, but in the broad scheme of thing, it's not, you still have to do that process because how else will you, as designers and installers and engineers, I'm right, that's all you guys, if something goes wrong, how do you demonstrate what process that you went through? And that's the bottom line. Now... The other thing that I want to talk about was standards, and I did talk about 4024, and how it's an excellent document, it truly is. Very demanding, and I think people of your calibre, you'd probably know that back to front. I think that's a reasonable expectation. Maybe not every maintenance fitter out in Victorian industry, 
But I'd say the people are at the front edge like you guys. That's your Bible. But then there are occasions when we need to go further. And here's one pulled off the internet. Um, that accident, this is all public record now because it's had its day in court. And if you're interested, I've brought it along as a resource for the tea break. There is an international standard to do with, let me get the title correctly, food processing machinery, mincing machines, safety and hygiene requirements. And when you read it, it started in Ireland and it's, um, it's, uh, it's uh, just about every other country that you might think within the European sector. And when we go through it, can I tell you, unlike two, uh, the, the other one there that talks about principles that then have to be translated, this tells us precisely what we need to do. Even down to the point of there's a thing called ergonomics of machine guarding which talks about if the mesh on a piece of machinery, and there's some dangerous part behind, if the mesh is big enough to let my fingers through, say it's one inch squares, the dangerous part needs to be at least six inches behind it. If it's gonna be an arm reach, to use the old language, I think that was, Peter, 48 inches? Oh, I just call it 850. <laughs> 850, you're more up to date than I am. And depending on um, the table, if the table's up to there, that's all you can get. The table's down to there that you've got ability to arch your back and still reach, I think that was like 54 inches or something like that. Now that's the ergonomics of machine guarding. That's all in there. You've got to read it and understand it and apply it. Or if you're like me, you go straight to the source. You see if there's an Australian standard or an international standard that nails the machinery that you're talking about. And in this case, for mincing guarding, there certainly is. That's the one. I can understand the operator of the butcher shop getting by with something off WorkSafe's internet. Something that's a mug's guide, two pages, three pages. But I've got to say, the people who are building these machines, and it's potentially some of us, these are the sort of documents that we've got to make sure that we are mindful of and take account of. As I said when I started, there are too many things that we see whereby it's substandard for a whole range of reasons. Sometimes out of ignorance, genuinely so. Sometimes out of cutting corners. There are some terrible things that I see these days as a consultant that I was shielded from when I was at WorkSafe because there are things people do that they'll tell you about today that they would dare to tell the regulator in my previous life. But I guess the, the, the key thing is we've got standards that we must work to and adhere with. Now this one, um, and we've got one of the best OHS blokes in the room, Graham. So Jim Kent Fitter and Turner will now give you a little tutorial on a bit of history. Now listen, just before you read it. I wish I got a dollar every time, 20 years that I was with DLI and then towards the end WorkSafe, when you go into a workplace and say, mate, you need to put some guarding up. And they'd say, oh, we're going to build it about this high. And I'd say, no, 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 you're going to make it two metres high. Oh, what do you mean two metres high? This will stop them from getting in there. And I'd say, well, listen, have you ever cut across a school grounds of a weekend, maybe walking your dog? It's because you can swing the leg ever so easily over the, over the fence and you're in this property. I said, now, if you're going to build a fence that high, you may as well put no fence because someone will breach that. On the other hand, if you go to two metres, that shows us that you're fair income. And if someone wants to go and get a stepladder desperately enough to climb over and breach that safeguarding, well, chances are WorkSafe will view favourably what you've done, right? Now, the whole idea of that, and they'd say things like, you mean we've got to make the machinery uh, dickhead proof? Right now, dickhead, I hate saying that. I'd say no, because people in the workplace aren't dickheads. People in the workplace are humans and they make mistakes. What you have to do is make the safeguarding mistake proof. Oh, yeah, okay. And then straight away they think, oh, this is the DLI inspector or the WorkSafe inspector being over the top. Now, let's share together what's the background to why you've got to make things mistake proof. And have a look at the year. Wasn't 12 months ago, guys, it was 1945. This is what the courts were saying then. And this position has been reinforced countless times since. And let's have a read. And the language, you'd have to be a judge to, to speak like this. What's dangerous? It is dangerous if it is such that it may be reasonably foreseen to be a source of injury to people who may be in the vicinity taking with them all the ordinary infirmities to which human nature is prone. Stop there. 
What he's talking about there are the people out there who are colourblind. Told you, I'm colourblind, didn't I? Anyone here colourblind? Uh, it's a very select club, let me tell you. It's right up there with the Masons. Five to, that was humour, by the way. Yeah? Five to seven percent of the male population are colourblind. The blokes are colourblind. The women carry the gene. Women can't get colourblind. They get something else. So it follows that the people in the workplaces are probably five to seven percent of workers are also colourblind. Now, if I had a row of switches there that were green and underneath them a row that were red, what do they mean? What's a green button mean? What's a red button mean? If you can see it. And I'm also told, help me out, you blokes might know this, I'm told the Germans have the opposite logic. You go to Germany, the green button means stop because green means the machine's at its safest now. If you want the machine to run, it's a red button, meaning the machine is now running, therefore it's at its most dangerous. Now, how do I know that? Because that cardboard manufacturer I spoke about brought sourced machinery from all over the world and when they got it all there, there was Spain, Italy, America, Canada, you name it. A whole factory full of machinery, $60 million, uh, $60 million worth from memory. When they put it all together, then they had to spend a small fortune getting all the electrics and logics to talk to each other. And that cost them a lot of time and a lot of money. So they're the sort of infirmaries that we're talking about. How about the literacy problem that we can find? Um, how about the people who've got noise-induced hearing loss? and all the other stuff. Cultural, we're multicultural, aren't we? How many people see things differently to us? That's what we're talking about there. Keep reading. The occupier or employer must realise that not everybody is careful. Many are hasty, careless or inadvertent. Some are unreasonable and even disobedient. It may be unlikely that they will act in such a way, but it is not only the likely, but also the unlikely accident that the occupier or employer must guard against. He must guard against all conduct which he might reasonably foresee. The limit of his responsibility is only reached when the machinery is safe for all, except the incalculable individual who does not merely do what is unlikely, but also what is unforeseeable, or at least not to be foreseen by any ordinary person. That's all of us in the room. Now, that was 1945, and I've got to tell you, when I first joined um, DLI, 1977, that was one of the major things uh, that informed, if you like, the Labor and Industry Act and how the regulators viewed things and applied things. So it's about making things mistake-proof, whether it's the height of the fence, whether it's the interlocking of the gate, whether it's using captive keys rather than just relying on a hard interlock or whatever it might be. So please keep that in the back of your mind because that really informs why we set the standards the way we do. Now this two slides, you know this, when we talk about uh, hazards, they fall into a couple of categories. There's the mechanical hazards, of which it's a fairly extensive list. And it's the non-mechanical non hazards. So keep in mind, when we're talking about a piece of plant, we're talking about the environment where it operates taking into account the physical changes, the way that people interact with it. Uh, a good example would be a robot. Um, the tool setter needs to get in there with his pendant on teach mode to get up close to make sure that the programming of the robot is right, that there'll be no damage done by the robot. The maintenance fitter, on the other hand, needs a different access. He wants to get in there when the hydraulics are energised, but ideally when the robot's incapable of moving and killing him while he's in that enclosure. The electricians, on the other hand, want to get in there when to do their fault finding on the electrical, again, in circumstances where there's no hydraulics and therefore there's no movement. And then the cleaners, they want to get in there two o'clock in the morning to clean the whole joint out. They need full access with nothing running, getting it pretty ready for the next 24 hour cycle. So these are the things that we've all got to be mindful of when we're uh, setting up safeguarding. Now, the last slide is this one. And I've got to say, plagiarised from Telstra. Um, to me, that's one of the most important slides. It says it all for me. Um, what we say is that there is an absolute relationship between a worker, the workplace where they are, and certain aspects of that, and the equipment. If I'm a forklift driver, for example, I need to have a licence, I need to have a level of maturity, I need to be trained, 
I need to maybe have an annual refresher just to keep it front of mind because forklifts are the most dangerous piece of mobile plant in use anywhere, particularly in Victoria where our manufacturing is. Um, and there's certain expectations of how I present at work. In other words, I'm not going to be coming to work half cut or high or whatever it might be. Then we come to the equipment. Well, the forklift needs to be maintained. It needs to have a daily pre-operational check, doesn't it? it? Needs to have a logbook to record the history of what's gone on. Um, the employer should have done a risk assessment of their forklift. And in a typical situation, that would mean two reversing mirrors, not just one. When I see a forklift with one reversing mirror, I think they don't understand what's the use of one mirror. It's gonna show you half of what you need to see. You need two plus the reversing beeper when you're going backwards, obviously, as well as the flashing light to warn everyone in the area that here I come. And in addition to that, a horn, so that when I'm driving through a doorway or I need to warn you that I'm coming up behind you, that I've got some way of communicating. And of course, making sure it's maintained to a high standard in accordance with the manufacturer's specifications. And then we come to the environment where the forklift's gonna operate. Now, in our regulations to do with plant, particularly mobile plant, because we've had too many people killed and hurt through being struck by mobile plant, you've got to have a traffic management plan. If we go down the waterfront, because of the size of the machines down there, they virtually separated the pedestrian traffic from the machinery, and they put a barbed wire fence in between. And if you, um, your big loader breaks down, you stay in the truck over the radio, someone comes over in a car and picks you up and drives you out. You just can't climb out and walk down the apron of a waterfront. That's how we do it today. It wasn't that long ago that we had a double fatality on Melbourne's waterfront because of a forklift with a big container uh, drove over a couple of people. It was tragic. So that's what they do there. If we come to another workplace, a topical one for the moment, I did some work at the Qantas Freight Terminal out there at um, um, Tullamarine. And uh, they had a manager, a new manager come in. He was terrific, first class, this bloke. He said, I've got a budget and I've got to do the cost business analysis and all of that. He said, but I know what we've got's not right, let's fix it. Took him 12 months and I've got to tell you, I think it's an, a WorkSafe award waiting to happen. First class, separating the pedestrians out as far as they could. There's even a product called, um, what's it called, Speed Shield. It won a safety award, like what Murray won for his valve that gave cost-effective uh, categorisation, given that we've already talked about that. And this um, say, uh, speed shield is a forklift package. I'm not here to flog it, by the way, I'm not getting no kickback, but it's the latest technology that's been made more affordable than ever before, that through transponders and things in the floor, you can actually control the forklift, regardless of what the driver does. So while you're outside, you can do your 10 kilometres an hour, but as soon as you drive over these three, four transponders that have been drilled into holes in the concrete, you can't get more than five kilometres an hour, right? So I guess what I'm trying to say is there's all sorts of things that we can do towards managing the environment. Now, it's only when we co collectively at the same time are managing those three things that we then finish up with what would be the safe system of work around the outside. Good point. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Graham, uh, when it first came out, a couple of thousand dollars a forklift. When Qantas were doing it, the basic package was 800 bucks. $800, and you know, you get the bells and whistles and all of that later on, so, yeah. Um, so, to finish, what I'm just wanting to say, I hope you find this helpful. When I do anything, before I go out as a consultant, I wish I knew this when I was an inspector. I reckon I would have been a better inspector. We go out, we focus on a bit of plant. That was one of the criticisms made of the old DLI. Even people who didn't know about the DLI, they've all reserved the right to have a view. We make no apology. We were fixated on the machinery, the power presses, the injection molders, all the high risk stuff. And yeah, we didn't do much on manual handling or noise. So over the years, there's, that's come into a bit of balance. But I've got to tell you, it would be a mug that goes out and just looks at the piece of equipment without taking the holistic approach. One, because it's a smart thing to do, but secondly, that's what's required by the legislation. Now, I think I might pull up there and ask if there are any questions. WorkSafe have got the easiest job, by the way. 
take all the emotion out of a big punch up between a you know in a workplace or a fatality and or and the solicitors are involved and all of that emotions hard anywhere but I tell you work safe inspector it's basically they come into the workplace and say hang on before you show us what happened show us what should have happened give us your procedures okay that's how the work should be done all right got that now show us what actually happened it's a gap analysis isn't it and then depending on what happened if the boss's procedures didn't go far enough to anticipate what's happened here with someone's demise the boss is in a bit of strife probably. If on the other hand the person's demise is because they've done something that they knew better and goes outside what the employer could have reasonably held responsible for as per our judgment earlier, that's one where WorkSafe might say well it's a pity the man's been hurt or worse. Uh, we don't think that the employer has a case to answer and that sometimes happens too. WorkSafe used to operate with a degree of predictability and they did that deliberately. Um, I have members of the time when Graham was one of the prosecutors and it would have been Graham's, cr your crew Graham that started this all those years ago, they worked hard at, when they prosecuted, they always had a successful outcome. None of the shenanigans and you know all the stuff you've seen on television, none of that. They only took to court what was a solid case, occasionally they might have lost but it was rare and the strike rate was something like 99%, it was right up there. And that in itself was a deterrent because you only had to say, oh, the DLI, God, that meant something. Not what you're seeing on the television today, things about, oh, an inspector visiting the workplace every 12 minutes. Well, I'm not sure about that one. What's happened since then is that the standards have slipped to the point where I think WorkSafe personal view here, and I know I'm saying this to camera just in case WorkSafe's listening, um, I see things that should not be prosecuted because someone should have been given a stern rebuke, reprimand, here's an improvement notice and I'm going to come back in four weeks and make sure this doesn't happen again. Right? And I see other things that should be prosecuted and if I was the inspector, throw the book because of the blatant nature of what's gone on here only to find that they don't get prosecuted. I guess what I'm trying to say is when we interact with WorkSafe at the moment, it's a bit of the luck of the draw. Depends on which inspector you get, depends on WorkSafe's priorities are at any given time. And it also fair to say it depends on what their workload is at a given time. Because the investigators that they have in there, um, they can only carry so many active files at a given time. So if you accept what I'm saying, that WorkSafe's a little bit hit and miss, and at times a bit unfair, and I believe that, um, that's of concern. But the way that we can avoid having any of those concerns is by just being in a position to know that we applied the proper standards and we did it in a diligent and proper way. And the last thing I'll say to you guys, I've been doing this stuff for a few years and I had an accident, uh, there was an accident at a place that makes cardboard boxes and uh, I got a phone call and I knew this had happened one day. You don't do as many risk assessments as I've done or you have done, You've all, you're doing this stuff. Uh, the amount of risk assessments, I mean, if you stacked them flat, they'd probably fill up that area over there. And I always do the best job I'm capable of. Even if they want to say, can you sharpen your pencil and knock 500 bucks off? If it suits me, I will, but they still get the same job. Because it would be an absolute fool that would do lesser a job to fit the time that's available, right? So that's how I operate. Not all consultants operate like that. And I thought, one day I'm going to miss something. I'm human. And I've got to say, over the years, I thought the day that happens, I'm going to be devastated if someone got hurt because of an omission on my part. But I'll take comfort in the fact that, well, I missed it, that's honest. Um, but I do my best work any time I can. Well, let me tell you, phone rings this day and it's a new manager, a bit of an upstart. He said, oh, you know that machine you did a risk assessment on three years ago? And I know the machine's reasonably well, like you people. Um, someone got their fingers caught. You know, you missed it. And I've said, oh, did I? I said, well, look, I'll come down. So I printed out the risk assessment, had a read of it, drove down there. When I get there, this manager's trying to pass it on to me. The reason he's doing that is because on his watch, he's removed one of the guards and someone's now been hurt. Now, it's only because I had an intimate knowledge and when I write a report, I've got good notes and all of that. I guess what I'm trying to say to you fellas, will we make a mistake? Yes. But I tell you what, the way that we get through that 
is by being able to demonstrate that we did the best job that we're capable of. You don't need me to give you a lecture on that, you already know that, you're professional people. But can I finish by saying, if we're not following what the relevant standards are to the letter, without cutting corners, we're leaving ourselves a bit open, more than a bit open. Now, I will be quiet. Questions, if you've got any. Hope I wasn't out of line with that crack about the Masonic Lodge, was it, no? Is that all right? Okay. <laughs> no questions? If you do miss something, are you liable? Probably. Gra that'll be one for Graham in a minute. It's a case of whether it's black and white. There's two sorts of liability. You can be sued, civil liability, damages. In terms of prosecution, you know, if you get someone's prosecuted and fined, uh, they can't sue you for the cost of their fine. Uh, but it is possible that WorkSafe could prosecute and insult you. They haven't done it to my knowledge, but they have, there have been a number of prosecutions of consultants in the UK where they've missed guarding issues or other matters. Um, can I say this? A, a large automotive company here in Melbourne and a fair income company, uh, they got a new OHS manager and she was very bull at a gate, you know, going to get it all fixed overnight. And they had the resources, by the way. And um, she's flat out on plant. I was there to do some work on plant and there was something else that came up. And I think it might have had to do with work at height. This is prior to the very explicit legislation that we have now about working at height. And I said to her, you need to put a plan around that. She said, oh, we haven't got time. We're focusing on plant, plants number one. And plant was their biggest issue, by the way, because they had like 4,000 items of plant making brutch and break and clutch components and all of that. And they're just starting to sell them into the American market. So big company, successful company. I said, Robin, Robin Gillis was a lady. I said, Robin, stop and hear me on this. If WorkSafe come in and you've got nothing, you're vulnerable. If WorkSafe come in and you've got a plan and the time frames are too generous to the company, then it's an argument about time frames. I said, you need a plan. Because better to argue timelines in context of what we're doing in the whole workplace rather than having nothing, all right? Now, I wouldn't want to be the designer, uh, manufacturer, importer, <laughs> supplier, installer that's doing stuff without being able to demonstrate that they've gone through a process of identifying the hazards, assessing the risk, controlling the risk. And you know what? Uh, I'll leave a business card if that's of any help, no obligation. You should knock up your own little sheet that when you're going out doing stuff, regardless of how big or small the job is, just to start documenting and recording some of the information. Now, if it's a complex piece of machinery, the risk assessment could be that thick. If it's uh, something that's pretty bloody piddling, it'll probably just be one page. Even though the law says you don't have to document it, you can carry it in your head. How do you stand up in the witness box four years later and say, I looked at that machine and from memory, I believe it was this? Nor do I believe that you should have to go through life looking over your shoulder worrying about work safe. Because at the end of the day, if you're doing the right thing, you've got goodness in your heart, you should be all right. Now, I know that might sound a bit naive, but I've been around long enough to know that if you are able to stand there, hand on heart, and say, I did a proper and best job to my ability, right, that's the best place to be. And if you're made of blue, well, that's why we've got experts like Graham that help us out of those things. It's a very sombre note to finish on, isn't it? Thanks for your attention. A good opportunity to be with some professionals and good luck with it all.